Oh. Well, thank you very much, Daniel. And this is Once Round the Park podcast number four. Oh, God. Yeah, so a slightly different approach today. Yeah, we're going to be slightly different, though. but not because, of, not because we're plants. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> okay, so uh, the difference between nursery and nursery, which kind of isn't isn't as removed. Of course it's not, it's just that one relates to plants and one relates to humans. <laughs> Day of the Triffids. <laughs> no, I'll, no, I'll never forget as a kid walking down Dysart Road in Grantham and seeing a sign that said plant crossing and having watched Day of the yeah. Triffids the night before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Ever so slightly different. Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, I merely suggest that we should take a slightly different route on, on the beginning of the, the, the walk around the park, which took us past the day nursery. The day nurse for little children. <laughs> for little children. For little, not, for little, ch- little human beings. Right. Of not which we are. We, which not we are the children. nursery at the other end of the park, which is for growing plants in. No, not, no, not that one. Okay. Because we're not the plants. No. <laughs> and why would we want to walk up the main road right to the very end to get onto the park? But I thought that, you know. Well, it's not the, uh, that far away for starters. It's literally the like life, 30, the life and death places. connection, I thought, was interesting. So, yeah. It's just, yes, it's just one of those kind of uh, just <laughs> frivolous kind of uh, uh, analogies, isn't it? From the cradle to the grave. Our discussions from the cradle to the grave. Yes. Except we've already missed about sort of uh, 45 years or so, or 47 in my case. But yeah, from the cradle to the grave. Look, nursery. <laughs> nursery, the day centre. We're now po- walking past. Which I always think is yeah. a really interesting location for an event because it's just in this entrance way to the park which is would that be an event for young young people no just generally community spaces i think we don't have enough open community spaces that are curiously enough more. it is right next door to the <laughs> <laughs> it is it backs on to the cemetery <laughs> that must be an odd experience as a young child. Yeah. What is all that over there? Well, you would <laughs> know. Parsons. What is all that? Well, I know there's those spooky stories that, that kids kind of tell each other. I mean, I remember primary school, there was loads of really big trees and some of them had weird shapes in them. And there was all sorts of stories that, you know, I and my friends would tell about, you know, the witches and the goblins that got eaten away and frozen the trees to the extent that I even freaked myself out and found it really scary going out of break time. Is, is, is death not scary enough? I don't know, death's an inevitability, isn't it? But actually, day-to-day fear, I suppose death can be part of your day-to-day fears, but actually, the, you know, the, the final consequence of death is... Uh, Unknown. Well, we're kind of. We're, well, I mean, it's not unknown, but I mean, but kind of, kind of unknown. It is a, it's, it's a right very unknown. different perspective for lots of different people. As I said yesterday, in my irony, thank God for atheism. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. at which point I suppose we ought to start talking about something. Well, relevant to the week, but not that that isn't relevant to the week. But. Yeah. Yeah. So spend a lot of time. Not a lot of time, but our in-between working times, from frustration to frustration, watching TED Talks and watching and reading the BBC News portal, and yeah, actually reading it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's been a thing of mine this week. The, the frustration of of name stuffing in social media and. The, the share for, it's not share for shake, share sake, it's, it's sharing which comes along with the assumption that this is my opinion, or, and they now have necessarily read it. 
Well, I think one of the things that, uh, that, that kind of cropped up for me was a lot with context to that name sharing thing. Yeah. Was uh, how much media there is out there, which is just people uh, kind of posting. I'm going to see such and such tonight. End of comment. And then no further commentary. So we've we've got. Uh, a whole bunch of media, which is just people telling themselves what they're doing tonight, and then kind of no feedback in terms of, oh, was that really good? Or was it, you know, what what, what, what did you like about it? What was cool about it? What were they about? I yeah. might want to go, you know. But it's like, Takeaway yeah. points, isn't it? What, you well, know. Feedback. Yeah. Feedback loops. I mean, where are they? Yeah. You know, what, where, what do people really think about? I mean, the people that scared about voicing their opinion because they might be somehow wrong, or because it might reveal something which they didn't know about themselves or, or what? I mean, I, it's I, just a lack of dialogue. I, I think we're so conditioned at the moment to living in the now. Social media moves so fast. Your Twitter feed scrolls down your screen. Your Facebook news scrolls down your screen. You know, Instagram pictures are taken and then they're gone in a moment. Snapchat, which, although it's changing, disappears in 24 hours. The whole sense that everything is transitory has not changed life and reality has always been that way but the memories the retention of experience we seem to have lost or maybe people are not learning the arts of communication <laughs> yes and one of the videos that we watched um, about millennials struggling with social skills yeah i don't think it's just a millennial issue i think where it has always been true that if you are a good social interactor in the real world and that was a practiced skill that a lot of people envied social media will come a little bit easier to you if not a lot easier yeah. however the other way around if you never quite mastered that social networking skill, as in networking and being social, you always struggled in the real world. Yeah. But well, I think I mean, it's becoming apparent that that skill, that ability to socially interact and engage in conversation, not necessarily small talk, but conversation is... Well, here's another thing that I think is sort of, uh, and, and I think this is probably always true, mm. but um, there's, there's always going to be a lot of subjects that people kind of just don't want to talk about because, I don't know, maybe they find them too sensitive or perhaps they sort of, uh, they move into this realm of the political that they don't really want to go in mm. because it, it nails their colours to the, you know, to the, nails their... Uh, colours to the wall, and, uh, and that, and they don't. People don't particularly want to do that because they think it'll damage themselves, damage themselves somehow, damage their opportunities in life, or damage their relationships with their friends. And sometimes you, you've just got to, you've just got to say that stuff. You just got to say, look, this is this is who I am. This is what I believe in. You know. And I think there's a, and I think it has always been true that people kind of. Uh, Certainly in my lifetime, anyway, mm. that people have often been a little bit kind of. I don't really want to talk about that stuff because it goes a little bit too far. But, but I think it creates a great barrier when people don't. Yeah. So, I mean, communication and dialogue and conversation take practice. And yeah. as much as I like sitting in front of my computer screen and making content and reading content and commenting on content, I'm not using the vocal process of expressing what I think, hearing it back at myself, yeah. hearing someone else's interjections and opinions, yeah. and forming in, making informed decisions. Yeah. That's right, I mean, you're not gonna just become an, on a, not gonna become an expert on something just, just by reading about it. Yeah. You need dialogue, you need, you need to kind of be able to appraise, this is what I've read, this is what I think I know, and then for somebody to say, uh, yeah, but you're, you, you might be wrong on that, that area, and there's more to it than that. And w when, when you have that dialogue, what it does is it, it kind of, okay, you, people can have different reactions to that. They can kind of say, oh, you know, I've got it wrong. Or, you know, you could have the reaction whereby, you know, you're, you're saying, well, 
I obviously need to look into this more. Yeah. So it's kind of, it's encouraging for the, you know, kind of depth. And, and isn't that what sort of, you know, debate and negotiations should be really all about? Yeah. But anyway, I mean, you know, well, I, I, think the, I think the point for me, uh, for my, the, uh, the frustration that I had this week, which was uh, trying to find locations where, uh, so specifically for me, where artists were uh, talking and debating about stuff. Uh, and I couldn't, I, I, uh, so far I just haven't really been able to find anywhere where that's going on. Uh, it, I just got, it, it was just uh, frustrating to me that uh, a lot of that kind of dialogue is, uh, is, is closed off in some way in terms of what is easily accessible. Uh, and I still, I, at the moment, I'm sort of undecided as to uh, if I'm just missing it or if the reason it's not happening is a good thing or a bad thing or, or how, all I know is it's not there and I would like to kind of be a little, try and become a little bit more involved in something and uh, and I can't find it. So that, that's kind of where I'm at with yeah. that. Yeah, I think things take time. I mean, one of the things that this... Um we uh, one of the things that I picked for this little walk, the paradox of choice by Barry Schwartz, and there was a point in there he was talking about, this is a YouTube video. yeah, it's a bit of a which I will put in the links. He allocates his students 20% less work, yeah. not because they're smarter than previous students, but the fact that the choices that they have to make around their day-to-day -day existence and their day-to-day -day identity as they grow up is just massively exponential than it ever was before. Yeah. And I think there's more to it. To, 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 I think the kind of, I suppose because I just really listened to that. Um, I think the thing, so what that, what, what his talk was really about was really kind of saying, look, in the West, we have so much choice now, we're kind of paralysed, we're <laughs> paralysed by choice. Um, and his argument is that in many ways, not in the only way, but in many ways, you know, in many ways related to just having more choice, it's making our lives worse, you know, because we're less satisfied with the choices that we do make. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. When, you, when you just have that kind of, you know, one of his examples was going into a store to buy that one pair of, the only pair of jeans that they, they, that they sell. That was not entirely true when I was young, you know, younger, but, you know, it was kind of, you know, kind of true. There was a, a limited range of, of options that you had. Uh, you picked the one, uh, you know, that, that you just really liked and you were satisfied. And then it you might settled not have been into... perfect. It might not have been perfect, yeah. but you know you were happy with that choice. Yeah. Now you have so many choices, and you know his argument is you may actually end up getting a, a better pair of jeans, but actually you feel worse about it <laughs> because uh, because it's not it, it's not perfect, and you, and you can't it, it still isn't going to be perfect, yeah. and the only person that you have to blame now is you. Yeah. You know? That that. So it's, that, kind of, it's, um, it's, it's paradoxical, that, yeah. that kind of, that, yeah. that, that, and, and so his argument is that the, uh, the, the mainstream paradigm that we kind of have in Western, Western culture is that uh, uh, choice equals freedom, mm. and freedom e equals the best kind of yeah. state that, that human beings uh, kind of require in life. Yeah. And I agree with him that actually uh, freedom is, it's an illusion, it's an illusion in terms of how well you know you think uh, your the uh, uh, your situation yeah. kind of is going. It's, it's, it's just yeah. not quite I think true. There's the shift of responsibility as well. The uh, the example he gave of the patient who'd seen the doctor, who yeah. was given a diagnosis, yeah. and they said there's this course of action and this treatment which has these side effects and these benefits, or you could do this, which is gives you these benefits and and uh, and these side effects, and you know, we'll so shifting responsibility. Yeah, shifting responsibility from the so-called expert, and, and sorry, I, I have to say, the so-called expert who gets paid way more money than I do, uh, to the patient. This, I think, this is this is largely in America, because I'm not. Quite sure yes, it was. Yes, happening. this was talking a little bit about America, uh, but I, 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 I empathised with the talk enough yeah. to, you know, to think that we can talk about this. So, yeah. So, you know, that shifting of responsibility so that things... The choice is now yours, so it's your fault if it goes wrong. You know, less so in the medical sense, more so in the consumer choice. You yeah. know, if it goes wrong, you've got nobody to blame the, 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 the new self. And it's like, well, 
You yeah. Know, how is that making my life better? Because I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily know what the best pair of jeans is. Or the best medical treatment whilst I'm ill and having been told that I've got a life-changing illness. Yes, there is the compensation culture. That's something very different. I don't really want to talk about that here. But the other thing is the root of mental health and mental well-being yeah, with the pressure right. now. And most mental illness seems to stem from dissatisfaction. You know, the fact that they're not happy against yeah, also, also the norm. Yeah, also helplessness. Yeah. You know, it's like the helplessness of uh, I don't seem to have any control over my life anymore. I don't even know what decisions to make. And this I'm is the paralyzed. You become paralysed by, by... Did illness. we ever have any control? When it was the factories and a lot of people in the working classes would get up in the morning, they would go to the factory, they would do their job, they would have their did, social did, circles did, did and then they would go like, home and they'd have their family and life. Did it feel like more of a bargain that you were striking with your employer? You know, you're sort of saying... And, okay, it, 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 that, it, it, this is a marginal thing, right, but it's kind of like saying, look, you, you as the employer, you need my labour, yeah? And I'll, I'll be a good, diligent worker for you if you pay me this amount of money. Yeah. And, and, and uh, that amount of money will allow me to live my life outside of this factory where I don't have to think about that anymore. And we'll go on with that bargain because, you know, that's, that's kind of like a cool arrangement. Okay. And we collect- exchanged something. Yeah, and collective bargaining was part of that process. It was never perfect. But now, Labour seems to have so little value to these people. Well, no, because of the changing world. We're, and Okay, so this is, this is another part of the... Uh, so be- just before we leave the Simon... Uh, Schwartz. The Schwartz uh, Barry Schwartz. Yes. Uh, YouTube video. The one really uh, important thing that he said at the end of that video was in terms of distribution of, the, of wealth. So... Uh, countries in which uh, that paradigm is problematic are, of course, wealthy countries where we have the uh, ability to have all that choice. So in very poor countries, they don't have so much choice. Um, and... so we're just being passed by... A, uh, Vehicles car. around okay. the park. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, in, so in countries where, uh, where there is, isn't that choice, there are other problems. There are other problems which, which are very real, real problems that people, people face with their everyday lives. Do they? Uh, so if it's a problem in very wealthy countries and, uh, and there's another related problem, uh, or maybe perhaps a you know, problem related to lack of resources in another country, country uh, the point he was making there is that actually it makes sense both sort of for both uh, uh, sets of people that um, those resources are actually redistributed. So it actually does us good not having giving up some of our material wealth and some of our choices, some of our financial wealth, and it makes it makes sense for them obviously to have more. Uh, and th- and that th- th- there's. A much better balance to be had there. I, mean, I just thought that was a very reasonable sort of argument to me in terms of, you know, why it's good for us and good for, and good for uh, other countries. And yeah, well, so. go and watch that video. It's the links are in the notes. Um, psychologist Barry Schwartz takes aim at central tenant of Western societies, freedom of choice in Schwartz's estimation. Choice has made us not freer, but more paralysed, not happier, but more dissatisfied. Go watch comments below so you were about to move on to another subject which which is actually very very relevant uh-huh so which was that what was that you can't remember that can you <laughs> you're about to make another point was this the doing of good uh well actually just before you before we sort of go into uh, go on to that video uh-huh i think i think i just wanted to make a point about productivity uh-huh because we we kind of we we're, we're sort of obsessed in the West, in terms of uh, in terms of sort of economics, um, looking at kind of themes like growth and productivity, and all basically all stuff that makes a company more money. You know, so the more productive your company is, the more money it's going to make, the more competitive it is. So it's all about yeah. it's all about competition. It's all about the adversarial nature of companies, and of course, then you know, going back yeah. to the human nature of we are kind of adversarial beings yeah. who, who are fighting yeah. over the same resources. Which... Okay, and the point for me with with that is that you know it it, it, it kind of 
re reveals to me that 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 is a paradigm that we really do need to shift away from. I think the segue that you were referring to that I completely missed was to uh, a bit more of an economic point. I'd found an article this week called Why Are Wages So Weak? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, links will be in the description. In August 2013, the Bank of England governor said it would consider raising interest rates when the unemployment rate came down to 7%. At the time, it was 7.8%. Today, it is a 42 year low of 4.3%. And rather than raising rates, the only adjustment the bank has made is to cut rates further in the aftermath of the referendum results. So, so this is how we can compete and how we can effectively use collective bargaining within the unionised structure because the great thing about unions is that everybody comes together and the union itself has a negotiation team made up of members and industry professionals from the working side and they meet with a management organisation who all want to have the best contract in their opinion, the union wants the best one in their opinion. But it only really works if the organisations are adopting the contracts that are finally debated and negotiated by the union organisation associations. Okay, but, okay, my question is though, and I, I know it seems like a pretty obvious answer, but why is all this important? Why is that, why is that important? It's, it's important. The workers, you know. Cost of living, more yeah. than anything. The, while we can see food rising in price, yeah. we aren't seeing any rising wages mm. and also the helplessness of not really having any mechanism in which to affect change. Yeah. And unions do give you that, but, at but, least. But, but the problem really being there is that why are those wages, how come is it that those wages are being driven down? And I, I think this kind of ties into the productivity mm -hmm. because what I perceive is and companies have always done this, they've always been looking for ways to streamline themselves or do things better, increase productivity. They, a company wants to basically be able to sell as much stuff as it can mm. for as little overheads as it can so that everything is profit. Yeah. That's the way that it becomes, that it makes loads of money, can expand, grow, blah, 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 you know. And so looking at uh, processes and, and resources, well, the, 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 human resources the, the, the human, is the most ineffectual. The, yes, the human resource is obviously <laughs> the one that the one that, uh, that most companies spend out the most on. Yeah. Uh, and or at least you know it has been you know, in in the past. Um, and of course you know we're, we're you know I've banged on about automation and uh, and robotics, but you know it makes obvious sense given that context of why a company would want to automate because it will reduce its overheads mm. and you know and so this lead, but that leads me on to on to uh, uh, another question is that if if that is the game that basically all companies will be starting to play. Mm -hmm. Everybody, so many people are going to become unemployed that there's going to get become at one point. At some point, there is going to be a tipping point, and I think a lot of people are starting to realise this that there is going to be a tipping point, which is why we start where where there basically aren't enough people to buy products anymore. And you know, even even if you reducing the cost of products through this incredible streamlining of uh, of how stuff is made, reducing the costs of of, uh, of, a, of a product. That if there actually aren't any people out there earning any wages anymore, they won't be able to buy them. Uh -huh. So it naturally, it leads on to these themes of the uh, like uh, universal income uh, and, the, and those kind of theories about how we solve that problem. But the the, the problem for me comes in is in the um, and I, I was asking the the one question I would want to ask the biggest corporations, the most powerful people in the world today would be, are you actually doing this for the benefit of humanity or are you doing it for your own benefit? You know, are you, is it your aim to basically just uh, amass all the money, all the resources, all the modes of production for your own ends and then 
uh, and then it's 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 a, a game of uh, right, you know, it's it, it's uh, it's then that corporation's prerogative. What happens to the rest of humanity? You know, is that is that what they're trying to do, or do they have another plan? Because I'd love to know what that plan is. Well, I if think there is a plan at all. I think this is probably a good time to introduce which country does the most good. <laughs> which is another video well, yeah. which is linked in the descriptions uh, and its introduction. It's an unexpected side effect of globalisation, problems that once would have stayed local, say a bank lending out too much money, now have consequences worldwide. But still countries operate independently, as if alone on the planet. Policy advisor Simon Anholt has dreamed up an unusual scale to get governments thinking outwardly, the Good Country Index. In a riveting and funny talk, he answers the questions, which country does the most good? The answer may surprise you, especially if you live in the US or China. 6.8. 6.8. <laughs> And, and the, the word that came through this in the end was good and what it means by the good country index. That, so we've just talked about corporations, are they in it for themselves or, for or are they in for, for humans? A lot of people have talked about a happiness scale, but again, happiness as... Well, there, well, there are various scales, aren't there? There's, you know, happiness... Uh, productivity, growth, economy, wealth, you know. But they're all inward those, looking. Those, those are the traditional ones. Yes, his argument is that um, ultimately they become very inward looking, even, even though we have globalisation <laughs> uh, of a lot of, in, of, a lot of uh, industries and, uh, and you know, modes of production. Um, it becomes inward looking because, of course, it's always one tribe doing well over another because we still have this adversarial uh, kind of outlook or inlook, if you like. You know, so it's always kind of uh, we're doing better than somebody else, and our success relies on somebody else doing bad because we're in comp competition with them. You know, it's like it's a, it's kind of a, an obvious thing to me that that if if I'm doing well. Uh, and I'm competing with, with somebody else that they necessarily have to be doing worse than I am. So it's kind of like a, it's a dodgy uh, uh, basis on which to kind of operate, isn't it? So, you know? so this... If, if, you're trying to do, if you are trying to do, uh, to, to make the world in the rest of a better yeah. place. You know, yeah. we, don't, we, don't, we shouldn't be adversarial with each other. We should, we should actually be working with each other. But I think, like, yes, the cl you know, collaborating and all of those kind of wonderful concepts, that the thing, I think the thing that I left this talk, this video with, was this notion of reasserting the word good yeah. And in my vocabulary, it quite often comes along with the word nice, that at school you were told to try and use something more imaginative than either nice or good. Well, it's quite an ambiguous term in that way, isn't it? But good, in this sense, I think, is... It's because it's such... Well, I think you still have to define what good means. And as he's saying, it's not good as in the opposite of bad. Mm. It's good as in the opposite of... And I can't remember what he said. Well, I, I think he was referring to things like, um, you know, say... You know, uh, Conscience. I think it's it, like how much you are contributing to the development of humanity. So not just within your country or a, a within a country which, is, uh, which believes in all of the same things that you do, uh, but also outside of that, you're looking. You're looking to how do we make the world a better place where, uh, where perhaps we're not in competition with each other, where we're not fight, uh, like you know moving towards war with other countries. Um, we may be very different from other countries, which is why we might or, perceive. Or make the competition be who's doing more good. I mean, there's a lot. Of, <laughs> I, personally, I I found his talk a little bit more woolly than a lot of others because I think there are there are missing kind of uh, uh, dilemmas in that. Uh, oh in yes, that but I, I think but the, I, kinda, I, I get what he's, the say, scales... he's saying that we don't necessarily measure uh, success in the right kind of way, or in a, in a useful kind of way. I, I think you know we also think of countries doing good as of the aid provision, and I think he highlighted that a lot of the countries that you expect to be 
in the top 30 aren't necessarily in that top 30 no. of 100. Well, he was a bit disappointed that actually it was most of the countries, but he did cite Kenya. That, Kenya uh, was in the top 30. Actually, we have to, I just need to check actually what um, what, you, what year that um, that talk was from. But I mean, uh, we're, I know. believe it could have been 2014. Right, so, so, so it's, it's a couple of years ago. So it, anyway, I mean, I, I I'm not I'm not I don't think I've ever actually seen the uh, the good index. <laughs> But, uh, but it, was, it was definitely an intriguing video and actually I think there are some quite, there are some in, re really quite focused themes there that I think uh, do, do, do tie yeah. into a lot of But I think there's that, that sense of self-questioning that we don't often know who to vote for and we don't know whether, you know, it's like the Brexit referendum, was it a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. I think if you can always ask yourself, is this a good thing? Is this going to benefit... Not just, Not us, just but me, well. but the people I know who are in similar situations. And when you're looking at voting for politicians, who is going to do the most good? And no, but I think it goes further than just the people that I know. I mean, we, I think you have to start thinking about, look, you know, this, is, this, is, this, is, this ties back to the uh, Barry uh, Schwartz. Schwartz video where he's sort of saying, look, you know, for us to improve everybody's situation in the world, we might have to give something up and to, in order to let other people have, have some of what we've got in order to make both of our worlds better, OK? And we have to decide that actually that is a, that is a worthwhile thing to do, not only for us, but for them as well. You know, and it's kind of... And, and not just token things, but actually perhaps we need to radically change what we have and, you know, what other people have in order for that to happen. And perhaps then we'll, we, we'll start to... Uh, address what might make uh, you know a country score highly on that good index you know and of course it comes with all sorts of problems because there's all sorts of fears well if we if you know how things are set up at the moment uh, you know if one country does that then it may well affect its growth and productivity and wealth you know and so you know generally speaking it might actually affect their ability to be able to to give that kind of help uh, so it, it can't just be a unilateral thing, I suppose, is what I'm saying. It's, uh, uh, there, has to be a, there, has to, there has to be a shift in thinking. And that's such a difficult thing, because as he was saying in his video, human beings tend to be quite conservative about change. Because, it, it, you know, in, in our uh, sort of primal state, it's like change uh, tends to equal the unknown, and we don't like the unknown because... Uh, what works for us already has kept us alive. So it's kind of it's a, it's a difficult, difficult choice to make, you know. But we also do know that sometimes we recognise that there is a need to change because uh, you know and something being, isn't working. Yeah, and being part of change, and I think whether it's a community group that you're part of that has a connection as a group to give you influence um, on a wider community or panel or whether you are joining a a unionized organization to stand up for your rights those things are so important yeah. um, and don't necessarily need to have a, a political affiliation to motivate them ultimately the people who are at the front of that process have to deal with the current political structure but in themselves the things that they're dealing with aren't inherently politically leaning in the party political sense but as always anyway as always i just kind of think you know whoever you are whatever your you know <laughs> financial or other situation might be i just think you, you can't just uh you can't just be withdrawn or whatever sit back and accept yeah. that what you, that, that, that that way of life that your chosen way of life is necessarily the best one. Yeah, it could come. It could cause the whole world to come a cropper. Who knows? You know, yeah. we're, we, we, you know, we're, whether you're rich or poor, or you know, whatever the colour of your skin is, or whatever your religion, uh, you, you, we are part <laughs> of the same. We are on the same planet. Yeah. And you know. well, we've had the wind in our face going all the way round today, so I do hope the microphone hasn't been too windswept. Yeah. Do like, please do subscribe, and do check out the other once around the park podcast there's now three as well as this one and uh, more rambling than ever. our extra dvd today should it get on will probably be universal tax credit